So before we dive in to today's passage, and we're going to continue our series on 33 AD, but we have a, a three theme, uh, theme here today because I want to announce something. We're going to celebrate Mosaic's 30-year anniversary. Come on. So excited. 30 years. It's amazing. I, I started the church when I was 12. Yeah. Yeah. This is a church that's had a history generations and generations and generations before we ever came here. But 30 years ago, the dream of Mosaic was really born. And we took a hard road to become this unique space, this unique people, this unique community, this voice around the world. And so we just picked this as a defining moment in our journey. We're going to celebrate 30 years together. And we're going to do this on, I don't know. Oh, that's an interesting de detail that's missing. And uh, May 21st? On May, is it there? Where? It's so, sm look at that. Wow. It's just screaming at us. May 21st, 2023. <laughs> so for those of you who do not require microscopes, <laughs> May 21st, we're going to celebrate our 30 year anniversary and we're gonna do this in a very specific way. I'm gonna ask you to do something so that we can have 100% participation. We're gonna ask everyone from now to then to pray about making a gift together. And we decided to make three our, our theme. You can give $3 so that everyone's involved, not just here in Los Angeles, but across the world. You can give $30, you can give $300, you can give $30,000, you can guess yes, $300,000, and for at least one of you, and maybe you can give $3 million, who knows? And so let's just start praying that everyone participates. Because for 30 years, we have been the recipients of what people before us did. And there were people who sacrificed, and they gave, and they worked, and they prayed, and they served. And then we received the benefit of that. And so when I came here 30 years ago, I received the benefit of so many people's sacrifices. And now thousands upon tens of thousands of people across the world have had a life-changing experience with Jesus because of this community. And so now we want to press this forward to the next 30 years. And, and so I thought even, even our kids can become a part of this. They can, they can give their $3. But don't just give it to them. Make them earn it. You know, make them work for it. And, and, and that way they can make a contribution, be a part of the legacy of Mosaic and, about, and the future of Mosaic. And I'm going to ask you to pray and to join us. And I would love to see us have 100% participation, not just in our campuses, but across the world. There's some of you, you, you join us every week from South Africa or from Europe or from Asia. I mean, I know there are people in Japan who join us every single week and, and people in South America who join us every single week. And if Mosaic is a part of your community, I want you to join us. Now, I, I'm, I was doing this event. This guy from Australia said, uh, when he looked at the cost, is that U.S. or Australian? $3 U.S. And, <laughs> and let's just find a way to do this together. And so I just want to uh, encourage you. Some of you, this is a time to pray big, dream big, sacrifice big, and be incredibly generous. For some of you, it might be the first time that you've ever participated in giving here at Mosaic. And you get to begin in a celebration with us. So remember, hold the date. I don't know how you could forget that or overlook that. May 21st. I am 64 years old. Don't ever put something so small up there. I can barely see Mosaic 30. <laughs> All right. You excited? Yeah. I am so excited. It's crazy for me because it's all converging together all about the same time. We're having our third year anniversary. And then dominoes, I turn 65. And then domino, 
My next book, Mind Shift, comes out. So I'm excited about this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. So we began looking at the Gospel of John. We began this series called 33 AD. And we wanted to look at the legend of Jesus. And we did sort of have a, a small, short hiatus during Easter. But we told you the end of the story. But most of you know how, how it really doesn't end, how it begins again. But I want us to dive back in to John chapter 15. This is probably one of the more common or popular or well-known passages in all the scriptures. One of the most powerful metaphors that Jesus uses. And, and I want us to go back there and read beginning verse 1. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be ever more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me... And I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. When I started reading this passage and, and thinking about it, the first thing that came to my mind is I know almost nothing about vineyards. And this was a common metaphor in the time of Jesus. In fact, it would have been more easily accessible to have wine than it would be to have water. And it was the, the common drink of, of the people. And so when Jesus talked about the connection between vine and branches, everyone understood exactly what it meant. Now, if you're from Northern California, you might have more familiarity with this metaphor. But when Jesus is actually talking, he's actually talking about a primary source connection. That humans are designed for a connection with God that may be overlooked, but will always haunt us if we don't understand how we're actually created to live. I started thinking this, this past week uh, about so many things, but one of them was, was uh, about the idea of, of the reality of a quantum field. And I started doing all this research on, uh, on quantum fields. And one of the things that really struck me, I don't know if you ever watched the show 1923, but in 1923, Taylor Sheridan has this era in mid-America where people are just moving from horse and carriage to cars. And then as I'm researching, I realize, wow, it was around 1900 where the first concepts of quantum mechanics were forming, emerging, and being considered. And I thought, how crazy that there's a part of the world that's talking about quantum physics and another part of the world that's trying to get out their horse and figure out if this car thing is going to be a thing or a trend. And again, realizing that the, the way that we engage in human history is so distinct, it's so different. Sometimes we're living in the past when, when it, actually the future is already the present. There are things that, that do not seem to be true. In, in, in fact, there's this one scene in, in that, that series where somebody's selling a refrigerator or a washing machine. And it was so almost alien as the salesman was talking about these new ingredients, and, and they were thinking, no, this is a con, this is a switch and bait. And I thought, how amazing, they were selling something where most of America was still struggling to get electricity. And so if you get a refrigerator, if you get a washer, you have an instrument, but you have to actually now be connected to the grid. And so now you're forever dependent on that source. And think about your house. You have a microwave. You might have an electric oven. You might have a refrigerator, a freezer. You might even have an electric toothbrush. Everything you have might be dependent on a grid that provides for you the source for you to live your life. And, and I, think, I was thinking about how now there's this new um, goal to have only electric cars by 
2035, is that right? 2035. I, I, I live in Hollywood. We have rolling brownouts and blackouts all the time. We, we still have days where everything just pop, just stops. And in fact, I was on the phone with Emerson the Watney in Mexico City, and we kept breaking up. And he goes, I don't understand, bro. I'm not moving. I'm in my office. I have Wi-Fi. He says, it's not you. I live in L.A. My Wi-Fi is spotty. My electricity is inconsistent. Nothing here is certain. How in the world are we going to move toward an all-electric economy when we don't have the source to fuel all those cars? That's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be Saturday. And you're going to decide you're going to go to the grocery store, but the grid's going to say, you're out. You have no source. I thought, this is crazy, because if there is a quantum field, there's energy everywhere. And of course, the sun is an endless source, it seems, of energy. And so there's energy all around us. We just can't access it. In fact, we're supposed to be. I don't understand science. But I think I'm supposed to be 100% energy. How about you? And so I'm, I'm told that NASA and energy are the same thing. We're just moving slower. So if that's the case, I should just be able to energize my car. Why can't I just put my hand up to my Tesla and go boom? And now it just rolls. Because there's this breakdown between the energy source and the capacity to access that energy. And Jesus is actually using a metaphor saying there is access to life. But if you don't know how to access that life, you're going to have the same kind of shortage that we're going to face now when we're trying to have electric cars without a grid that can actually even sustain our electric refrigerators. Some of us are trying to live big lives without accessing the source of great lives. Jesus, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. And so he's saying all of humanity fits into this metaphor. He says he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will even be more fruitful. And so Jesus is actually giving us this image. He's saying, you were created for connection. And what's fascinating is this connection goes in multiple directions. You, you might immediately go, oh, okay, Jesus is saying that we're designed for a connection to God. But he's also saying that we're designed for a connection to each other. He's not saying you are individually a little branch. He's saying you are the branches. And so the way God looks at humanity is that we're all this one organism. We are this vineyard together. We're not a lot of different vineyards in a lot of different places. We are all the vineyard of God. And God designed us for interconnection with each other. And life only happens best when we actually move in community together. So no matter how talented you are, how gifted you are, how extraordinary you are, you will never live the life God created you to live without valuing the interconnection with other people. And if you're not connected to other people, you're not a branch, you're a twig. Because the weight of this vineyard, of the source who God is of life, can only be experienced when we're connected together. You ever notice that it's, it's nice when you sing alone, but it's not the same? But when you sing with other people, something happens? One, when you're singing with other people, suddenly you sound better. You're just so much more talented because when you're singing with other people, your voice becomes a part of a, 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 a choir. And in that moment of worship, you're connected not just to God, but you're connected to others. What happens when we come together, you don't come here to experience God individually. We come here to experience God communally. And when people say, well, you know, just, it's just me and God, you misunderstand. Because God is too big for just you. See, you, you are not a branch by yourself. You're a twig by yourself. You may have been pruned by yourself. You don't even realize you're not a part of the vineyard. But when you're connected to life, 
You not only connect to God, you connect to others. That's one of the best evidences that you are living in the fullness of the life that God created you to live is that other people become your highest value. As I am the true vine, my father is the gardener, and all of humanity is his garden. And then Jesus makes the statement, remain in me as I also remain in you. And so Jesus is letting him know that there's a connection that he has come to reestablish between himself and us. So it's not about a belief system. It's not just about getting the information right. It's not just about knowing all the right answers from the scriptures. It is about having an intimate connection to the creator of the universe that connects you to the primary source. And then he goes on, in case we're not clear, he says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. It's interesting that Jesus clarifies, because there's probably somebody who's going to say, oh, I'm the vine. Jesus, let me be clear. You're the branches. I am the vine. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so it's to me beautiful that even though he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, then he says, you're the one bearing fruit. Because when I look at pictures of vineyards, it seems to me that the vine is the one bearing fruit, not the branches. And yet, this is how good God is. You're the branches, I'm the vine, the fruit is actually coming out of me, but that's your fruit. Because when you're connected to me, everything that I produce is an expression of who you are as well. And then he makes this statement, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a pretty harsh statement. And in fact, I, it doesn't even feel like true. I mean, I did stuff before I knew God. I did stuff before I believed in God. In fact, I see people that I actually really admire who do kind of awesome stuff. Are we allowed to say that? They don't even believe in God. They're like counter God, anti God, but they're kind of awesome. We're not allowed to say that. You, you don't pick your NBA team because they love God. <laughs> You're a Laker fan. <laughs> you do it in spite of who they are, not because of who they are. And we admire people. We, 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 if you love boxing, you love George Foreman before he met Jesus. In fact, I remember interviewing George and he's saying, I used to just be so full of hate. And when I would fight, I just, I was motivated by hate. I just wanted to destroy people. And then I met Jesus, and I just wanted to punch him out of love. I thought, okay. <laughs> sort of, it kind of works for me, I'm not sure. But you don't usually pick your boxers or your athletes or your, even your presidents because they love God. You, you, you pick them because you either admire them or they accomplish something you can't do or they do it on your behalf, psychologically. And yet Jesus, apart from you, you can do nothing because God doesn't measure things the way we measure things. See, God's not going, oh, wow, he got eight NBA rings without me. How did he pull that off? Because you see, in the spectrum of eternity, that's not anything. And when he says, apart from you, you can do nothing, all of a sudden it echoes to something else. Because if you think that's Jesus being really harsh about what you can accomplish without him, what could Jesus accomplish without his father? See, Jesus actually said, apart from the father, I can do nothing. Which is kind of amazing since Jesus is God. You think Jesus would say, I'm the exception. You can't do anything. I can do everything. That's just the way it rolls. And yet Jesus understands primary source. I want you to understand that apart from the Father, I can do nothing because God is the source of life. If Jesus could somehow delude himself into believing that he was, would be self-contained if he could somehow be separate from God, 
You want us to understand that apart from the Father, he could do nothing, and apart from him, we can do nothing, that we're designed for connection, and this connection is everything. See, this connection is everything. Aaron did us a great gift. And, you know, one of the great things when you have kids is they're always helping you live up to the technological revolution, right? You know, <laughs> he's like, Dad, you should no longer have cable. Cable's a thing of the past. And so he went ahead and just eliminated all of our, all of our, connection to the outside world and uh, <laughs> bought us these really expensive Apple TVs and showed us how he, he could use his phone to change the channel to turn it on and off and, and the other day came in our home and <laughs> we, you know we have a TV in the bedroom and a TV in the living room and a TV in the back house and and I'm, I'm trying to make this thing work, and I can't get it on in the living room, and Kim's already in bed, and then she sends me a text. You turned the TV on upstairs. Could you turn this TV off? See, I didn't even know I could do that. I had so much control <laughs> over other TVs, and then she texts me, the TV in the back house is on. Could you <laughs> and go turn that off? I, I could control everything except for the TV in the living room, and, and then it starts spiraling. And it, it, somehow the, the 10 feet between me and the TV was too great a distance <laughs> for the control on my phone to command the, the TV. And, and I, I, was, I just wanted to throw my phone into the TV. And, and Kemp said, can we secretly go back without telling Aaron? <laughs> I said, no, we have to find our way into the future. <laughs> we have to make this work. There's a, there's a connection, but the connection is everything. And, and we're living in a growing reality. Well, we realize that the invisible connection is the most powerful connection in the world. And yet somehow we still don't get this when it comes to Jesus. The connection between you and Jesus is everything. The connection between you and God is everything. It's been an interesting dilemma just on a personal level, if I can share this. I, um, I've done something that I've not done before, even though I've written about a, a dozen books. This next book is not what people would consider a Christian book. It's not a, a faith book or... It doesn't fall into the category. So when you go to Barnes & Noble's, it will not be in the Christian section. It will not be in the religion section. It will not be in the spirituality section. It will be in the business section. It will be in the social psychology section. It will be in the personal development section. And, and it's interesting because I've already been posting a few things about it, and I've already had comments, where's Jesus? That, it's interesting. It's crazy. I, I mean, I could say, I wrote a book called The Genius of Jesus. He's still in the last book. I, you know, but it's like, <laughs> it's almost as if, if you don't say Jesus in every phrase, you're, you don't really believe in him. But it's also this, it's almost as if, if you look at life realistically, you're not really a believer in Jesus. And, and, and so Kim asked me, and I, I, I don't usually tell people what I dedicate, who I dedicate my books to, but... She goes, who'd you dedicate this book to? They're always wondering if it's them. And, uh, <laughs> no. and, and I said, I, I dedicated this book to Jesus. Because it's my first book where I really don't talk about him in the whole book. But every thought in that book is affected, influenced, inspired, shaped by who he is in my life. And so the connection is still there. It's, and I think a lot of us think that, that the words are what matter. It's not. I mean, when, when you cook food and you realize, oh, this needs oregano. You go, oh, yeah, yeah, but oregano doesn't like, it's not about Jesus. <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're looking for a plumber, you go, I need a plumber that believes in Jesus. Or you go, I need a plumber who knows how to plumb. Again, everything else in life, we seem to get it, that there are real things in life. 
And what's fascinating to me is that, that for so many of us, we actually act as if what we say is what makes our faith real, rather than the power of the connection we have with Jesus. See, God created you for connection, and that connection is everything. And that connection will be the source of your life. And if you pay attention carefully enough, and if you access that source, that life will become the source of everything you do. It was a couple of weeks ago, Kim was on the phone and she was angry because Kim does a lot of work around the world. And sometimes there's a lot of injustice. And she was angry on the phone. And she decided to pull a steak out of the refrigerator. That was my steak that I did not give her permission to cook. And, <laughs> but she was trying to be nice to cook me dinner. And she was on that phone. If you know my wife, she can get intense. And she's on that phone being so intense. And my steak, I could feel it absorbing all that anger. And I went in the kitchen. I said, stop it. You're ruining my meat. All that anger, all that, that, that violence is going into my meat. My meat needs love. It needs tenderness. It needs compassion. And... and and it seems crazy unless you're a chef. And you know that what you bring to that moment matters. And sometimes you can taste the lack of love in a meal. <laughs> you were indifferent. <laughs> and sometimes you can taste the love. Because that's the ingredient that transcends spices. And what happens when you connect to Jesus, it's not that you're always talking about Jesus. It's not that you're wearing Jesus shirts. It's not that you're speaking in the King James. It's that everything about who you are is informed by your relationship with him. And he is your source of life. And that life emanates from you to everyone around you. Um, And so Jesus says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Then Jesus wraps us up by saying, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you may bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is telling us that you are created for connection, a connection to the God who created you and a connection to each other. And this is how we bear our fruit. We bear the most fruit when we're interconnected together in healthy relationships. And the connection is everything. The connection with God and the connection to people, that is what makes life worth living. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is supplemental. Fame, power, wealth, stuff. It, it, they're, they're just, they're wonderful add-ons, but they are not life. But if you will live your life making your relationship to God and your relationship to people the highest values of your existence, I'm telling you, you will look back on your life without any regret. And then Jesus says, not only is the connection everything, but the source is limitless. It almost terrifies me to say this. I used to believe these verses without hesitation. I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you that sometimes I read verses with hesitation. But I do. See, when I, when I was young and crazier, I just believed everything the Bible said without question. And then I go through phases and I go, really? Is that what it means? Because my experience begins to pull down the scriptures rather than me allowing the scriptures to pull my life up. So let's just, let's just listen to the words of Jesus and accept them as they are. 
For just one moment, I want you just to suspend belief and allow this to sink in as if it really is true that Jesus actually said this and meant it. He says, if you remain in me, that's the criteria. Not if you're smarter, more talented. If you remain in me, and my words, my wisdom remains in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Would you just want to have one day in your life where that verse was completely true? But there's a relationship here that it can be subtly missed. See, it's not, oh, wow, I just have to believe in Jesus, and then anything I ask for, he'll do. Not because, you see, if you're the branches and he's the vine and we're going to produce fruit, we're going to pr produce fruit that reflects the character and essence of God. See, when you're a part of the vineyard, you produce grapes. And those grapes produce wine. And some of us think, oh, he says, I can ask for whatever I wish and it will be done. But God will never produce oranges when you're designed to produce grapes. God's never going to produce pecans because you're designed to produce wine. So we say, God, what I want is I want wealth. And he goes, no, you're supposed to produce meaning. God, I want fame. He goes, no, no, you're supposed to produce integrity. See, you are a part of the vineyard of God, so you do not get to decide the fruit that's produced from the vine. The fruit always has to reflect what the gardener's intent But when you are connected to the source, what you ask for creates life. See, I think we got this backwards. We go, oh, if I can get this right, I can ask for whatever I want and God will do it. I can hold God hostage to my desires. No, it's, he's saying the exact opposite. You can know that you're actually connected to the primary source where whenever you ask for something, it happens because you're asking out of my will, out of my intention, out of my character. See, I want to be so connected to God that whenever I ask, God says yes, because he says you are right on with my intention. You're asking for exactly what I want to give you. You're asking as an expression of my heart and my character. I want to stop trying to make God do for me what I think God should do. And I want to be so connected to the primary source of life that I can identify life properly and say, God, this is what I want. God says, I've been waiting for you to ask for that. He says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. We live in a culture right now where if you in any way bear much fruit, you become the derision of others. We are not in a time where people will celebrate even God doing great things in your life. We do not live in a time where people will celebrate your success. We do not live in a time where people will celebrate your wins. We do not live in a time where if you overcome obstacle after obstacle and refuse to give up and endure and are faithful and then somehow you overcome and you rise to the top where people will go, we love your story. And yet what Jesus tells us is that when you connect to him, your life will not be less, it will be more. Your life will not be less, it will be more. Do not believe the lie that spirituality can only be proven when you move toward nothing. Jesus says, this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. And when I think of what the scriptures teach us, we know that primary fruit comes out of our character. It's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. That, that's the first fruit of God. It's who you become and how you live your life. 
And yet it doesn't end there because Jesus over and over and over again tells us, if you believe in me, the works that I do, you shall do even greater works than these. For I go to my Father in heaven. See, I am convinced that you're supposed to be an unexplainable proof of God. There are things that are supposed to happen in your life and through your life. They go beyond your talent, your intelligence, your capacity, your understanding. Your life is supposed to be a surprise to you. Because if your life is just an extension of your talent and your capacity and your abilities and your skill and your education, then the only source you're tapping into is you. But God is bigger than me. And when I tap into the primary source, I am now unleashed to be more than I could have ever been by myself. I'm unleashed to be more than I could have ever imagined for me. Because now I'm not limited by my capacity. I am now tapped into the source who created the entire universe. And I want that kind of life. And that's what happens when you connect to primary source. It's so frustrating when I have one of the most technologically advanced vehicles in the world and it says you will not make it home because you're out of energy. And it redirects me. This is the cool thing about my car. You will not make it home. It just lets me know that. You stupid, stupid man. <laughs> and, and even though I have navigation on, it suddenly renavigates me. And it sends me to a charging station, a super charging station, where I have to sit in line because there are other stupid people <laughs> who thought their vehicle could run without electricity. And then I plug it in and I sit there for an hour and a half so that I can get enough charge to get back home. And I used to do this with gas. Yet you ever, you're on empty, you think, oh, I can make it. I can, when I was young, you could find me on the side of the road. But back then, I would just have to walk a mile to a gas station, buy it a can of gas and a hose, suck it into my mouth, swallow a little of it, <laughs> pour it into the tank, get home. That's not the way it works anymore because now I cannot do that. I can't just go <laughs> and then suck in electricity, come back and just, and just plug my finger in and recharge that thing. Once I'm out of juice, I have to make a phone call and say, I cannot move. I need help. And I wonder how many of us are so fast in moving our lives in our own strength, in our own power, in our own wisdom, in our own insight. We don't have enough time to stop and refuel, to connect to the primary source that will keep us moving forward. And there's some of you who have never entrusted your life to Jesus and you keep wondering why your soul is exhausted. It's because you're just running on fumes, but you were connected, created to be connected. And that's why Jesus came. Through his death and resurrection, we are reconnected to the God who created us. We are reconnected to the primary source and we have access to unlimited strength and power because the connection is limitless. The source is limitless. His power is limitless. And that's the life you're created to live. Would you just bow your heads with me just for a moment? Jesus said, if you're tired, weary, exhausted, can no longer carry the weight of life. He said, come to me and I will give you rest. 
There's some of you here right now, you've never crossed the line of faith and opened your life to Jesus. And your soul knows that it's not connected to the primary source for which you were designed. And what you need to do right now is make a decision to give your life to Jesus. He said, if you abide in him and he abides in you, then you will bear much fruit. You were created to be in a relationship with the God who created you. And his name is Jesus. And he is the connector to life. If you're here and you're ready to connect to life, if you're here and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, I want you to pray this simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just tell Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. This is how the connection begins. You give him your life, he puts his life in you. You will abide, remain in him, he will abide, remain in you. The connection will be made and it will last forever. If you just prayed that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life, I wanna pray for you very quickly. If you prayed that prayer, just raise your hand right now and let me know. If you pray, Jesus, I give you my life. Beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. Anyone else? Beautiful, wonderful. I love that. So good. Father, I thank you for these that in this moment have opened up their lives to you. I pray that today would be the day that the connection was fully made. That they would know they belong to you that you now dwell within them and they now dwell in you. They are connected to the primary source of life, the primary source of hope, the primary source of love, the primary source of faith, the primary source of joy, the primary source of all that is good and true and beautiful. And I pray, God, they would just open their souls up to receive the wealth of your limitless goodness in them. I thank you, Father for them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We just thank God for all those who respond to him right now. So good. So good. You have friends that are struggling through life. There are people in your life you, you may not even be fully aware of that desperately need hope. I just want to encourage you this week to do two things. One, to make sure you're connected to the primary source of Jesus in your life. And then to just naturally let that life be expressed everywhere you go. And people around you will begin to ask you, where do you find your joy? Where do you keep finding that hope? Where do you keep finding that optimism? Don't worry about how you talk to people in terms of how do I talk to them about God? Just be fully alive and watch what Jesus will do. Love you guys.